Well, welcome to Summit Church. My name is Kaylee Newkirk and I'm on staff here and I just want to thank you for joining us for worship today. And if you're new, we're particularly glad that you're here. Um, and, and if you'd like to, to know more about the church, if there's anything we can do to make you feel more comfortable in this worship experience, you can click the Get Connected link below so that we can greet you personally and answer any questions that you have. One of our values here at Summit is that we want to invest deeply with our time and our talents and our resources, particularly to protect the most vulnerable children in our city. And one of the ways that we do that locally is by forming care communities. We partner with those involved in the foster system. And, and a care community is just a group of people, like a Summit Connect group or another group of people, who come around these foster families and, and meet their needs, both their tangible needs and, and, and offer them emotional support. So if that's something that you uh, feel your heart beating faster for and you'd like to get more information, we're going to have a care community orientation next Sunday, July 12th at 1230, and that's going to be via Zoom. There's a link below that you can click, and it'll give you all the information you need and give you an opportunity to sign up. So we're going to continue now in worship. Uh, we're in our summer series, Then Sings My Soul, and we're going to be hearing from campus pastor Zach Van Dyke on Psalm 10. I would encourage you as we go through this series this summer to, to join us in the reading plan. There's a link below there. You can also click to get involved in that. You can jump in any time. And, and, and as we explore the Psalms, our hope is that as we steep ourselves in the poetry of the Old Testament, that we will actually begin to look more and love more like Jesus. We're also going to continue worshiping through the giving of tithes and offerings. Now, if you're a guest, please know uh, we're so glad that you've joined us. And, and our prayer all week is that this service would be a gift to you. So feel no obligation to give. If you are a regular attender or a member of the body of Christ anywhere, then you know why we give. We give out of obedience to scripture. We give out of a sense of gratitude for all that God has provided for us. And we also give out of a clarity of vision, understanding that, that God can use our temporary and finite resources to build his infinite and eternal kingdom. If you're worshiping today with, uh, with a group of people, with your roommates, with your family, with your Summit Connect group online, again, we're so grateful that you are doing church with us today as a community. So let's worship now together the God who sets us free.
Let's pray. Father God, we come before you 
because we're yours and not because we've done enough or because we're good enough or because we're worthy, uh, but simply because we belong to you, that you thought us up, you created us. So Father, would you remind us today what you made us for? Would you call out what is most true about us? Would you show us the ways in which we have lived counter uh, to your good plan for us? And Father, I thank you that you've allowed me to do this work. I think it's crazy that I get to do this work. Um, I surrender myself to you. I surrender my thoughts and my words, the things I've studied and prepared. I give it all to you to be used however you so choose. But please, Father, by your Spirit, come and speak to us, your children. In Jesus' name, amen. 244 years ago yesterday, these words were ratified by the founding fathers of our country. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, one could rightly argue that many of our founding fathers um, had a very limited and also ungodly view of who that includes. But there's no denying that those are powerful words to build from. How you start is important. The way you begin something is important. Jesus started his public ministry with very powerful words. We're told in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus goes back to his hometown. He's around the age of 30. He's been working as a carpenter. We don't really know much about his life prior to this event. But he goes back to his hometown. He goes to the synagogue, and then he stands up to, to preach his first sermon. And they hand him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. And he, he looks through the scroll, and he finds the place where these words are written. Let me, uh, let me read it for us. This is Isaiah, I'm sorry, this is uh, Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the word that inaugurated the kingdom of God. That's a big deal, what you preach your first sermon on. My first sermon here at Summit, which was seven years ago last week, uh, was on Genesis 3 and the fall of mankind. Now, I don't want you to think too much about what that says about me, but I do think it's important to note what Jesus chose as his first sermon. With those words, he declared a kingdom of life, liberty, and true happiness for all. And after reading that passage, after closing up the scroll of Isaiah, we're told he looked at the crowd who had gathered and he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Did you hear that? Jesus wasn't just talking about something that will one day be, although that is true. One day there will be a new heavens and a new earth where every tear will be wiped from every eye, where there will be this kingdom of peace and love. But he's also talking about what is happening right there and now. He taught his disciples to pray, make it on earth as it is in heaven. These are things that are not just to be longed for, but are to be pursued now. So Jesus, with those first very powerful words, declared here and now good news for the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight from the blind, and the setting free of the oppressed. Jesus began his earthly ministry by declaring what will one day be and acknowledging what needed fixing. So how are we doing as the church, as the ones who have joined Jesus in this mission of, of building the kingdom of God, of, of making it on earth as it is in heaven? How are we doing? This isn't a political thing. This is a kingdom of God thing. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, uh, aren't we spending 
this summer in the Psalms. Didn't Kaylee just say Zach was going to teach on Psalm 10? We're getting there, okay? I promise. I promise that what seems like a side road here to get us started will make sense. So just stick with me. We will get to Psalm 10 in a minute. But this is important context for what God has laid on my heart to share regarding Psalm 10. In his book, um, Just Mercy, by Brian Stevenson, uh, there are many lines in that book that when I was reading it really struck me. But there was one early on uh, that really gave me pause. He said, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. What a striking thought, right? But what does it mean? Well, if you were to go and do a study of justice in the Bible, if you were to go and look at all the ways in which justice comes up in the Bible, what you will find is that Brian Stevenson's definition is a pretty good biblical definition. All truth is God's truth. It doesn't matter where it comes from. If it's true, it's from God. And a lot of times you and I can discover a truth in something uh, that isn't God's word, but then when we go back and we examine it in light of God's word, we see that it's true. So a good biblical definition for justice would be to say something like the opposite of poverty is justice. The Hebrew word for justice is mishpat. And it's a word that doesn't just mean acquitting or punishing someone based on the merits of the case against them, you know, despite uh, their race or their social class. It, it's not just about making sure that there's no prejudice in declaring a judgment. It also means to give people their rights, to give people life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In Proverbs 31, 9, it says, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. In other words, don't allow the vulnerable to be left behind. Over and over again, mishpat is used to describe taking up the cause and the care of the oppressed. Often mentioned as the oppressed are widows, are orphans, or immigrants, or the poor. Zechariah 7, 10, and 11 says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the immigrant or the poor. Now, when the Bible was written, much of the society was agrarian in nature. And so a lot of times when the Bible talks about justice and when it talks about the oppressed, it mentions specific people that in that type of culture would be most at risk to becoming oppressed. In his book, Generous Justice, Pastor Tim Keller suggests that in today's world, it's appropriate to expand that definition of the people who are oppressed to include the refugee, the migrant worker, the homeless, and in some cases, single parents or, or the elderly, and in some contexts, particular races or ethnicities that sometimes those are the people who are most at risk to becoming oppressed in a society. And he says, based on uh, the mishpat or the justice of a society, if you base that on what the Bible says, we will all be evaluated by how we treat the groups of people that are considered oppressed and any neglect to their needs is not just a lack of mercy or charity, but in fact, it is a very violation of justice. In other words, it's a sin worthy of the wrath of God. God over and over again identifies himself as a father of the fatherless, as a defender of widows. Psalm 146, 7 says, He executes justice for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. Deuteronomy 10, 17 and 18 says, The Lord your God defends, defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the immigrant, giving him food and clothing. If you were to read the Bible and try to determine what is it that God most wants to be known for, it seems as if he wants to be known as a God of the oppressed, that he's a God of the oppressed people. And with Jesus' first sermon, that's confirmed. Now, you might be checking this out today. Maybe you, you're not a church person. Maybe you've never been to church. Maybe you haven't been to church in a long time, and, and a friend or, or your mom has sent you the link to this sermon, and you thought, I'll give it a look. I have a question for you. Is the main thing you've heard about God 
is that he's a God of the oppressed. If not, that's a clear indictment of God's people. That's an indictment on God's church. It means we have not been about the very thing that Jesus declared in his first sermon. This isn't a political thing. This is a people of God thing. Because, y'all, the hope of the world is not in a particular government. It's not in a political party. It's not in some social service organization. The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. And you and I, those of us who are followers of Jesus, those of us who are part of his church, we are called to be his hands and feet. The religious leader in Jesus' day wanted a Messiah who would come and bring a new form of government. Who would, who would change the way government operated. But instead, Jesus brought the church. That's the hope. So whether or not we have a government that's known for, for being uh, for the oppressed people, no matter what our government is known for, we as the body of Christ, we as the church, we must be people of the oppressed because that is who our God is. So how do we become that? How do we live into those words that Jesus started his ministry with? How do we build upon what Jesus started when he declared that the oppressed would be free? Well, we have to start by acknowledging what is oppressing people. We have to start by looking at what is enslaving us. And that brings us to Psalm 10. See, I told you we would get there. Psalm 10. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears no one will ever do me harm. His mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like a lion in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed. They collapse. They fall under his strength. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. Arise, Lord. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he will not call me to account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. This is God's word. So in order to be set free, we have to acknowledge what's enslaving us, wickedness. Psalm 10 gives us a rather illuminating description of wickedness. If you and I want to be about what Jesus started with that first sermon, if you want to be about building on those words that launched the kingdom of God, that inaugurated the kingdom of God, we have to understand wickedness. We have to understand that which works against the kingdom of God. You and I have to be willing to examine whether or not we have been wicked. In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says this, The right direction leads not only to peace, but to knowledge. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly that evil is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. 
A moderately bad man knows he's not very good, but a thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you are awake, not while you are sleeping. You understand the nature of drunkenness when you are sober, not when you are drunk. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. So you and I have a choice right now. Right now we have a choice. We have a choice to either ignore what God says to us in Psalm 10 or we can take a deep breath. We can put ourselves in a posture of humility and we can say, search me, O God, and know my heart. I was giving you a little bit of time in case you wanted to turn this off. But if you're still here, if you're still with me, it's so much easier to walk away online than to walk away in person. Although there have been people who have walked out uh, during a sermon of mine. But, but if you've stayed, if you're ready to open yourself up to really looking at what wickedness is, I believe God has something for us. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go verse by verse. We're going to go verse by verse to try to better understand wickedness. So verse 2. In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. Wickedness is described as a hunter here, as one who manipulates the weak. Wickedness marks out the easy targets and then develops a plan that will take advantage of them. How many of you sold Cutco knives in college, right? I mean, that's kind of the idea, although I don't think that necessarily that the people behind that have a bad heart, but there is this sense in which wickedness figures out who is weak, who is most de desperate, and then devises a plan that promises them great wealth, but in fact, oftentimes makes them poorer. Verse 3, he boasts about the cravings of his heart, he blesses the greedy and reviles the Lord. The wicked is greedy. But what an interesting way to describe greed. He's greedy, why? Because his desires went out every time. Because he knows best. Because the desires of others are subject to his desires, to his discernment. He follows his heart. If it is right for him, if it's something he believes in his heart, it must be right. The prophet Jeremiah warns us against such things. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond all cure. Who can understand it? Verse 4, In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Now, y'all, this one hits pretty hard. As I was thinking about this one, this one felt very close to home. It felt, it felt like, in, in a way, it's confronting the rugged, prideful individualism behind the American dream. It's describing wickedness as being self-made. You don't need God. You do it on your own. God didn't give you a leg up. You had to work so hard for everything you have. None of it's a gift. All of it has been earned. You've pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. Now listen, I know some of you have worked really hard uh, for what you have. In fact, maybe you even came from almost nothing. That's my granddad. I, I'm doing a funeral um, for a man um, who, who came to this country not knowing a bit of English, and he's been able uh, to provide for his family. There's nothing wicked about working hard and providing for yourself and your family. There's nothing wicked about building something from the ground up that blesses you and others. It's not wicked to be successful. But it is wicked to think that those bootstraps aren't a gift. It's wicked to think that the ability to pull those bootstraps up is not a gift. The wicked has no room for God because he is self-made. Verse 5, having fun yet? His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. This is an interesting one. Think about this. 
If his ways are always prosperous, what does that mean? What is that saying about the wicked? It says he always wins. He's always prosperous no matter what. Why? Because he always wins. It never cost him anything. Think about that. Wickedness means you always win. And if you always win, what does that mean? No one else ever wins. You just keep getting richer and richer. You just keep getting more powerful and more powerful. And it never costs you anything. But is it costing others? You don't care. There's an interesting law found in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 15. It's a chapter uh, in which God tells the people of Israel that if someone becomes an indentured servant to one of them because of a debt that's owed, they go and they, they work for them uh, to kind of pay off that debt, that after seven years, if the debt's not paid off, that you are to wipe the debt clean. It doesn't matter how much is still owed. You're, you're to wipe it completely clean. But then it goes beyond that. In Deuteronomy 15, verse 14, it says this, Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. What's that saying? It's saying if you obey God's law, it's going to cost you. Not only as a person who follows God are you called to provide relief for those who owe you, but in fact you are called to, to be economic developers that empower those who owe you. God's law says my people should be so committed to radical generosity that they engage in the economic development and empowerment of the poor. It will cost you. Wickedness doesn't cost you like obedience does. And Jesus made that very clear to his disciples. He told them early on, he said, hey, listen, if you really want to follow in my way, if you really want to be about building this kingdom that I keep talking about, you're going to have to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. There's a cost. You can't always win. In fact, sometimes winning is actually losing. Verse 6, he says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears no one will ever do me harm. The wicked believes he's unstoppable. The wicked believes that, that nothing will ever get in his way. Right now, I'm going through a Genesis every morning on my Instagram and commenting on it, and I have been so fascinated by how current it feels. Like the, the oldest book in the Bible, uh, the very first book of the Bible, is so current to where we find ourselves today. Um, and that's even with all the crazy stuff in Genesis, like arranged marriages and, you know, angels wrestling with people and oaths made by placing your hand on another man's thigh. Look it up, Genesis 24 too. Um, but, but that first book of the Bible, Genesis starts off showing us that after the fall, after we rebelled against God, if we are left on our own, without the grace of God, without God intervening, you and I will always have the mindset that we are unstoppable, that we in fact will believe that we can be like God, just like the serpent promised. And we see that at its fullest expression in the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, remember that story? It's in Genesis 11 where the people come together and they say this, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. I talked to you all before about high school acting, and I love going and watching high schoolers act. But there's a thing about high schoolers that they just, they just can't help it. Whenever they have a monologue, they seem to overpronunciate any personal pronouns in that, in that monologue. So let me read that again. Let me read what the people at the Tower of Babel said as a high school actor. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Next time you go to a high school play, you're going to notice it. You're going to hear it. Every time they use a personal pronoun, it's going to be over-enunciated. But did you hear that? Did you hear the self-consumption, the self-aggrandizement, the, the self-reliance? The wicked believe they are unstoppable. Verse 7. His mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. The wicked lies. He can't be trusted. And in fact, when he's called out, he threatens and he bullies. 
Our lead pastor, John Parker, has been uh, such an encouragement to me, especially in this time in, in particular. And the one thing that he keeps reminding me again and again, and, and he does it with such grace and patience, he reminds me and again and again that I need to first listen to understand, not to decide whether or not I agree or disagree. The wicked don't listen first to understand. They listen to decide whether or not they agree or disagree immediately and then go on the defense. They go on the attack. Verse 8 and 9. I'm combining them now because this is getting long. Um, verse 8 and 9. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush he murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like a lion in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. The wicked doesn't fight fair, right? He lies in wait. He, he sneak attacks. Uh, why, why do wrestlers, why do wrestlers have to weigh in before a fight? Because they want the fight to be fair. The wicked don't fight fairly. In fact, the wicked are cowards. They refuse to fight on a level playing field. And you know why I think that is? I think it's because deep down, we all know the truth. Like every single one of us. In that, in that stillness, in that quiet, in the middle of the night when we're up and we just... We, we, we just can't go back to sleep because we're so troubled. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. I think whether or not you believe in God or not, when you come to that place of stillness, God reveals himself to you. And either that revelation is a comfort or you choose to reject it. And when you reject it, you respond like a coward. So the wicked is a coward. Verse 10, his victims are crushed, they collapse, they fall under his strength. More bricks, less straw. Can't you hear the echo of the slave masters of Egypt over God's people? The wicked add to an already burdened people more burden. But listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, come to me, all who are weary, who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If God has ever sounded like an evil slave master to you, it wasn't his voice. Verse 11. And this is the gut punch. He says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. That verse describes a wicked theology. A theology that says, God doesn't care. God doesn't see. If you aren't in power, if you are weak, if you are afflicted, if you are poor, if you are oppressed, if you are black, God doesn't care. God doesn't see you are getting what you deserve. Dave Chappelle recently put out a, a comedy show that he did, um, and it's had like 30 million views on YouTube. So I know I'm not the only one of us who's watched it with all that salty language. Uh, but what's fascinating to me in, in that comedy special is he very vulnerably uh, and from a real guttural place addresses his feelings about the murder of George Floyd. And, uh, and when he's talking about it, he, he says what struck him most in watching that horrific video even more so than watching the, the officer with his, with his knee on the neck of George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds. He said even more than that were the other officers standing around with their hands in their pockets. He said, who are you talking to? What are you signifying? that you can kneel on the neck of a man for eight minutes and 46 seconds and feel like you wouldn't get the wrath of God. 
it's as if he's crying out Psalm 10. A wicked theology that reinforces the lie of the serpent. God doesn't love you. You are less than. God doesn't care about what happens to you. So who is the wicked? Who did you, uh, who'd you think about as we went through that verse by verse? Who came to mind? As I was working on this sermon, and I've been working on it all week, specific people kept coming to mind with each verse. But nothing changed in my heart until it was me, until I saw myself in these verses. Now, some of you, some of you are the oppressed. And you can read this psalm from the vantage point of the psalmist. You can and you should cry out, Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? But I would also say, none of us should be too quick to miss the opportunity of examining ourselves before God's Word. Like C.S. Lewis said, it's common sense, really. Good people know about both good and evil. Bad people do not know about either. The reckoning that's happening in our country right now, and not not just over issues of race, but issues over the abuse of power, over sexism, over sexual abuse, the church should have been the leading voice. These issues break the heart of God. And not only that, these issues God will judge. The turning point in this psalm comes in verse 14 when it says, But you, God, you do see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and you take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you, for you are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would otherwise not be found out. Jesus knew. Jesus knew all of this when he preached his first sermon. And what's fascinating about that first sermon is he he pulls out the Isaiah scroll. He finds the place in Isaiah 61 where it says, you know, I've come to proclaim good news to the poor and freedom for the prisoners and to, uh, to give sight to the blind and to set the oppressed free. And then it says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's That's not a complete thought. If you actually go back to Isaiah 61, Isaiah 61 verse 2 says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. But Jesus purposely stops before vengeance. Why? Because he knew God will judge. He knew that God hears the cries of the oppressed, that in fact he knew that God would pour out his wrath against our injustices, but they would be poured out on him. The reason Jesus stopped where he stopped in that first sermon was because he knew that he would absorb the vengeance of God so that you and I could live in the Lord's favor. If that's true, Christians, then you and I, we are free to confess our sin. We're we're free to confess our wickedness. Not only are we free to, but in fact, we are called to confess our wickedness. You and I, because of what Jesus has done, you and I can, can, without fear, look at every thought, every action, every system, every government, every way in which you and I have worked against the kingdom of God and Every one of us is guilty. If we don't do this, who are we talking to? Do we not believe the wrath of God that sent our Savior to the cross? This isn't a political thing. This is a kingdom of God thing. Are we willing to examine everything we've built? everything we've been a part of, knowing that there in fact is a God of justice and that there has ever only been one righteous person. There's ever only been one who never engaged in wickedness. God in his grace gave us one worthy of a statue and then told us, don't build it. Instead, build a kingdom of love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. This isn't a political thing. This is a people of God thing. The psalm ends with these words. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations will perish from his land. You, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed so that mere earthly mortars will never strike fear again. Martin Luther King Jr. in his famous speech said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. How you start is important, but there's always hope in how you will finish. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a trustworthy saying, worthy of our full acceptance. Christ died for the wicked, and if that's true, then you and I, can confess the part we have played in wickedness while still fighting to build a more perfect union. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is living and active. I thank you that your word has the ability uh, to change us, to shape us, to reveal to us. Um, And Father, I hope that that's what's happened today. I hope that each of us have been able to see more clearly what you've called us to. We've been able to see more clearly the ways in which we have lived counter to that calling. And Father, I pray that we would have hope that we can still be a part of building what you came to build. That you uh, started uh, with coming in the form of a servant. You started a kingdom that each of us is invited to be a part of that each of us is invited to fight for, that each of us is invited to sacrifice for. So, Father, would you, like you taught us to pray, would you make it on earth as it is in heaven? And we pray all of this in the name of the one who took on the vengeance, who took on the wrath against injustice so that we could forever live in your favor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
So what do we do now? Where do we go from here? I think an appropriate response uh, to whatever God did uh, through Psalm 10 uh, is communion, is to go to the Lord's table and remember who Jesus is and what he's done for us. I know it's weird now that we're not meeting in person. Uh, we haven't been able to participate in communion like we normally do, but there's a link on the sermon page where our lead pastor, John Parker, kind of walks you through how you can participate in communion uh, in your home. So I encourage you to do that. Take some time. Go to the table and remember that Jesus' body was broken for you, that his blood was spilled for the forgiveness of your sins. When you and I understand that we have truly been forgiven, we are free to be honest about the ways in which we have been wicked. So I encourage all of us to take some time this week uh, to go before the Lord, to go before the Lord's table and remember what Jesus has done for us. I also encourage all of us to continue to read, to continue to read some of the resources that we've put out there um, about the things that are going on with race. And listen, again, all truth is God's truth. Some of the resources, we're not going to agree with everything that's being said there. Some of the resources, uh, there might even be some things that we are vehemently opposed to. But can we engage them in such a way 
that we listen to understand first before we decide whether we agree or disagree. So I hope uh, that this week, as you as you begin to uh, live in the reality of the fact that we are part of the kingdom of God, I, I pray that you will take seriously your call, God's call in your life to be a part of building that kingdom. Hear these words of blessing and benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go in God's peace. This service is ended.